All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming, um, I guess, right after the keynotes and on the last day. So just a little curious, who here has used open telemetry before? OK, cool. All right. So by the title, you probably figured out we're going to be talking about open telemetry for automatic and manual instrumentation. If you don't know what that means yet, that is perfectly fine. We'll be going into that. Uh, who here uses Java? All right. And who uses Python? OK. Mm. Pretty cool. All right. So yeah, hi, I'm Tiffany Jernigan. Um, I do developer advocacy things such as this. Um, I just became a CNCF ambassador like two weeks ago, so this is my first KubeCon after that, so that's pretty cool. Um, if you want to see what I've been up to, you can just go to tiffanyfay.dev, which is also my blue sky since a bunch of people are starting to use that now. And then the QR codes are for our LinkedIn's, and then LinkedIn and X if you still use it on the bottom there. And hi, I'm Toby. I'm a senior observability consultant at Novatec, a German consultancy company. And I'm mainly working in the area of observability and consulting our customers in improving their observability infrastructure, also by using open telemetry. That's also the reason why I'm taking part in that um, talk. And before we, we're going to start, um, yes, uh, we have some credits to some, some awesome guys, to Jan Niklas Tille, Jens Flüdemann, and also Matthias Häusler who basically built uh, the um, Open Telemetry Lab for the Linux Foundation. So without their work, we wouldn't be able to kind of provide you this talk. And uh, many thanks uh, to you and also for supporting us uh, in, in preparing um, that talk. And a little fun fact, we talked for the first time and met literally three weeks ago. All right, so this is kind of the little agenda of what we're going to start going over today. So kind of give a little overview of things with open telemetry. Uh, there's going to be multiple demos. Um, so we're just going to be going through things pretty much live here. So we'll see how that goes. Um, so there's a bunch of different things for if you want to go and follow along. Um, so we want, there's only two of us, obviously. So we can't come along and try helping people. So it's kind of up to you if you want to do as well. Um, basically, there's a new Linux Foundation uh, training course. Uh, so that's the one on the left there. You may have also seen them say today that there is a new open telemetry certification. And this is free, so that's cool. And then the one on the right is also linked in the other one, but it's the GitHub, which has all of the code and other things that we're going to be going through as well. And basically, you can just also jump to the um, GitHub repository, and uh, you can just um, clone that repository. And we are basically yeah, using dev containers um, for all the environment, so you can also just start that in your local uh, Visual Studio code, or you can also use code spaces. We are going to show how you can do that also within the talk later. OK, so just to make sure that we kind of like level set for everyone here, for the folks that maybe are less familiar and whatnot, um, just kind of go over what te open telemetry is a little bit. Um, I guess who here has heard of like the phrase of like the three pillars of observability? All right, so actually not as many people as I thought. OK, so those typically people just refer to those as being like your logs, your metrics, and your traces. Um, somewhat recently, there is also People referring to the fourth pillar as continuous profiling, which we are not touching at all in this. Um, there was a talk at, I believe, like App DevCon that uh, Mauricio and Jonas gave about that if you want to look into it more later. So basically, there's a bunch of different tools out there that you can use to collect telemetry data. So telemetry being like things like the logs, metrics, and traces. I mean, if you've looked at the CNCF landscape at any point in time, you can see that it's pretty huge, and it just keeps getting bigger. So it can be kind of complicated sometimes being like, hey, which one do I want to use? And then having to go and set all of that stuff up. So basically, open telemetry is like an open source observability framework and a standard that basically it provides like a collection of APIs. There's SDKs, or, and this is for a bunch of different languages, hence us talking about like Java and Python. And then there's tools to do things like instrumenting, generating, collecting, and exporting that data. So there's a bunch of different backends that you can use to such, there's about like at least 40 um, vendors right now that are natively supporting it using the open telemetry protocol, which is, you'll see OLTP a few times throughout this talk, which is just the shorthand for that. 
And so there's also a number of supported languages and frameworks. So for this one, we're specifically going to be using Java with Spring, and then we're also going to be using Python with Flask. Okay, so this is kind of a list of things that OpenTelemetry is not. So it is not an all-in-one monitoring or observability tool. You can't just go and be like, here, this is OpenTelemetry, let me see all the things. Um, it's not a data storage or dashboarding solution. It is not a pre-configured monitoring tool, and it is not a performance optimizer. All right, so the first section that we have is called OpenTelemetry in Action. So this is what our like demo application architecture looks like. Our application basically is just like a simple to-do list. Um, there is a Java Spring Boot backend, so we can see that over here. I guess I'm not used to using this tool. There we go. All right, so um, we have that over there, and then we basically. Our Spring Boot application is a REST server that uses Spring data and that interacts with our uh, Postgres database, so we have that for persistence. So then after that, we have basically two identical uh, front ends, pretty much. The only difference is that one is using Python and Flask and the other one is using Java and Spring and Timeleaf. So basically, this actor person is just say, for instance, me, and interacting with it. There's also a simple load generator that is constantly running to have some sort of traffic that just adds an item on this to-do list so that way we have something happening. All right, so this is what our uh, application architecture looks like when it is instrumented. So with OpenTelemetry, so if you don't know what instrumentation is, basically it's the process of adding code or using tools to collect telemetry data. So basically, if you look at it, there's a few different things that got added here. So one of the things that we have is we ha on our Python one, we have an OpenTelemetry agent here. On our Java one, we have an agent as well. So we have one for the, both of our front ends. And then we look over here, we also have a Java one for our back end. And then we also have a collector. So this is the OpenTelemetry collector, and basically it collects and exports data and we're having this specifically for going over to Jaeger, which we're using for our tracing. And then we have uh, Prometheus for our metrics. In this part of the demo, at least, I'm not going to be doing anything with logs. All right, so let's actually dive into some of these things. All right, and let us know if things aren't visible and we can try changing like font size and whatnot. Um, also, since this is a German keyboard, there might be some typos or issues with that, so uh, bear with me. Okay, so the first thing that was already done is there, inside of the directory, there is a Docker Compose file, so we're not running stuff on Kubernetes on this, we're just using Docker, um, and so I ran it earlier, so that way we don't have to do it now, but if we do a Docker PS, uh, it's a little bit hard to somewhat read some of those things, but there's, basically there's eight pieces of the application that are up and running. Uh, we can see that we have, say, our uh, backend that we have, we have our Postgres, um, we have Timeleaf, basically all the different pieces that we just saw um, on the uh, sli couple slides ago. So one of the cool things um, when you are, so this is VS Code, and then just like using with the dev containers, we have this tab here that is called ports. Do you know if this gets bigger? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's the whole thing. Okay, so um, basically there's this whole section of ports that are set up um, inside of like the settings for the dev container. So if we were to just go over here, you can see that there's our Python Flask app, this one's for something we'll be doing later. So if we click on this icon here, then we can go and open that inside of a browser. So this is the beautiful Python front end for our to-do list. Um, so I was mentioning earlier that, that was, there was a load generator. And so you can see that there's just the sample one here, it'll just come and go. And so like if I added to-do, uh, let's see, maybe I have to clean when I get home. Something I don't wanna think about right now. Um, all right, so we have that there. If we go and 
open up another tab, if we go to localhost, whoops, 8090, which we could also have gone through over here in our ports. Um, this is the Java one. The only difference literally is from this point of view is whether it says Python or Java. You can see that the one that I added via the Python uh, front end is here because they are both showing the same back end. So if I have another thing, I don't know, let's just say uh, laundry, which of course I would pick something that requires me to figure out where the Y and the Z are. <laughs> so if I go and add that, um, so we'll take a look at what that looks like in a little bit. So if I go over here and shrink things back down again. Uh, so this is my Docker Compose file. So I have my different services. I have things like I have Postgres. I have my backend for Spring Boot. Basically, there's just all the different pieces here. Now we can see that there's a bunch of different environment variables that I have set up here. Um, so you can see a bunch of them are starting with OTL exporter, OTLP. So there's one here that is the OTL resource attributes. You can see that it's just basically whatever I decided as my service name. So here, for instance, this is to do backend Spring Boot. If we scroll through, we can see that we also have one for Timeleaf. We, can, we have one for Flask. Basically, every single service has that on there. So basically, this is how components basically identify themselves within the open telemetry scope. And de sometimes, depending on how lazy I feel today, I'll either say OTEL or open telemetry. But we'll take a look at how we can go and actually configure some of these things later on. So right now, it's just set up for us. So another uh, shared thing here is this OTEL exporter OTLP endpoint. If we go and take a look in our environment variables file, um, we can see that everything here is actually for the OTEL collector and it's just being put together. Um, so we have our host, which is OTEL collector. We have our port for gRPC. We have it for HTTP and then just put all of that together basically. Okay, so now if we go back to, nope, I will figure out where the internet is. Okay. So if we go back over here, I can actually just jump to Jaeger. Okay, so we can see that we have our different services that are here. So we have our Spring Boot backend, we have our uh, Flask front end, and our Timely front end as well. If we go and take a look at our back end and we click Find Traces, we can basically see a bunch of different dots that are over here. So if you look over here on this part, the x-axis you can see that is time. So literally, like you can see right now, it's 11:13. This just happened not too long ago. And then over here, this is duration, basically how long is it taking. And then each one of these dots, you can see that there's basically different sizes there. So the, how big or how small they are is dependent on the number of invocations or spans. Um, so who here has heard of a span before? Okay. So about half of the room. All right, so basically spans, they represent like a unit of work or an operation, and they are building blocks of this thing called traces. You can see here there's 20 of them. Each one of these things that we have, so this like to-do UI Flask add, all of these are, each one of these is uh, a trace. So basically traces are like a path of a request through your application. So let's go and actually take a look at one of these. So if we look specifically at this one here, um, we can see that it says that there are 10 spans. So this is for an ad. So if we go and look and see also here, there's this section, whoops, I can't draw all. Um, the section <laughs> that shows that there's two components. So we have our uh, Spring Boot backend and we have our Flask front end. So if we go and actually take a look, click on one of these, um, here we can see that there's the two different colors which are differentiating between the two different app components basically. So you can tell the top two there are the ones that are specifically for Python. Everything that is the turquoise blue color is using uh, Java and Spring. So that just kind of makes it a little bit easier to see what is happening there. So if we Look here, you can see things like there, it's a little bit harder if I, let me scroll this over so you can see what is happening. Okay, so here you can see what is being called. So you can see that this is an ad, 
we're doing a post on the front end, there's also a post on the back end. If we go and actually just click on this, you can see a bunch more information. So you can more clearly see like how, like what the service is. So we can see that this is like to do UI Flask. You can see that how long it took. You can see what the start time is. And then if we go and click on our tags here, um, you can see that the, it specifically is telling you, hey, this is using something with OpenTelemetry. You have the internal span format that says OTLP, and you can see like what the URL is. If we then click on process, um, we can see also more information here. So we can see what library is being used and that it specifically is like the open telemetry one. Um, we can see things like what the SDK language is. So we know that it's Python. We can see the SDK name, which is just open telemetry and like the version, just a little bit more information there. If we go down to say this one, which is for our backend, um, we can also take a look. It's a little bit different looking. So this one is similar here. You can see like um, basically things for this one. Um, you can also see the OTLP as well. You can see that you have your package, which is Ion, Ovatech, and then to do backend, and then it's calling to do repository. So the, or it's for the to do repository. So then if we click here though, it's actually a little bit different for how it looks. Um, it's just basically information that the open telemetry agent gets. So we can see like library name. This one actually goes and tells us like what the command arguments are. And then you can see like what is the executable. You can see that it's using like open JDK. So just like a few different things here that you can see more into. You can also even see here that it's using spring data. So it's using that for uh, interacting with our database. Okay, so if we go look here at the top, like most things are taking, the amount of time each thing is taking is somewhat similar. I guess like the highest it goes is this one here and that's a little less than 30 milliseconds. So that's pretty similar. Um, since we're not gonna just like watch and hope something changes, um, we're going to simulate basically performance issues or just like something taking a lot longer. So one way that we can go about this is if we go back to our um, front end. So if I just type slow here and add that, if we go back to Jaeger and find traces again, we can now see that there's this one here that is taking quite a bit longer. If we look here, we can see that it is taking one second versus around like 20 milliseconds or less. Um, there's different ways you can go click on it. For one, you can see that it's happening right here. You can see it's the 1.05 seconds. You also can just go and click on it. And then this should look a little bit different than what we were just looking at. You can see that basically there is one span that's taking much longer than the rest. If we look a little bit over here, you can see that, if I can scroll properly, um, it's taking one second, and then all these other ones are taking so much less time. So then if we go and take a look at, say, um, our, let's see, our internal method. So we have this thing that's called some internal method. I'll poke into that in a second, but basically it is part of the backend code. If I go and click the right thing by opening it instead of closing it, um, if I click on tags here, um, basically we can see things like um, what is, so if I click here, um, all right, so basically, yeah, this is our tags. Um, we can see that we have what the method name is. So we have some internal method. Um, we have what our package name is. So IO Novatech uh, to do backend. And then we can also see what our class is, which is the to do backend application. So basically, being, you can see a little bit more information as to like what is going on, which can help you go and basically debug things since now you're like, hey, I know where this is actually going and happening. Okay. So then if we go back over to this. All right, so that's showing what happens if something is taking a bit longer. So the next thing I wanna show is what happens if you actually have some sort of error. So if I go and type fail here. So we can actually see that an error is happening. If you try this on the Python one, it actually checks for this and it'll work in the sense of you'll see the Python list or the, front, the to do again, it's not gonna actually throw an error because it catches it. Um, but so for this one, we can see that we're having that happen. If we go back here and then find our traces again, 
um, we can go and see that very obviously there's something happening. There's this red one, and we can see that it says error here. If we end up scrolling down here, we can also see that it's here and that there are four errors. If we go and basically click on this, if we look here, you can see that it's showing up through the front end. If we go and click on, say, our uh, internal method here, which is the last one that we can see the little red exclamation mark with our error, there's actually a log here. So that's something that we weren't seeing a little bit earlier. So if we click on here, we can see that it's giving a runtime exception. If we click on here, you can actually see like what the stack trace is of what is happening, which also helps you debug things a little bit more. So if we go and take a look at our code here, so let's see. Sorry, there's a lot of files here. Uh, there we go. Okay, so let's. Okay, so we can see our code here. Um, so we have our some internal method, which we knew is where things are having an issue. Um, so the first thing that we're doing is we're actually just saving it to the database, which is why when we look back over here, um, we can, if we go back, let's see. Ah, sorry. We can see that basically the save is not actually having an error because that is happening beforehand. If we go look here, the next thing for the slow one is we're just basically adding a sleep, making it take a second. And then for the fail, we are going and throwing a runtime exception, which is what we saw um, when we were looking at the error. So another thing that we can do is that we can actually do a comparison um, between um, some of the different traces. So like for instance, if I wanted to like do a get on there, and let's see, let's look at one for Flask. So we can see that it's clicking these two and that I can go and click compare traces. And so you can actually see like what is happening. So you can see that you have Flask, it's going over here. There, you also have Timeleaf. They're talking to, the, both of them are talking to the Spring Boot backend. Um, and then basically you can just kind of look and see how different things compare and whether it is basically what you're expecting them to look like. All right, so the next thing that I'm going to, so that's what I'm gonna go for at, for this section at least um, on traces. Um, who here has used Prometheus before? All right, a lot of people. I guess I can't remember if I actually asked. Who here has used Jaeger before? Much less, all right, cool. All right, so the next part will be a little bit more familiar since um, most of the room actually raised their hands, so that is pretty neat. Um, Julius probably will appreciate that. So if we go back over here, I can go and open Prometheus. All right, so if you see this little like globe icon, basically if you're like, I don't know what metrics there are, um, you can go through and actually just click on here and scroll through all the different metrics that you already currently have. Um, so for instance, if we look at all these ones for JVM, um, those are basically all the metrics that the Java agent is collecting. Um, you could also just specifically type in JVM, for instance. Um, if we go back up here and we just start typing OTEL, then we can see a bunch of metrics that are coming specifically from the open telemetry collector. So if we wanted to say, I don't know, let's do JVM, um, yeah, let's do thread count. And then we can go and just click execute. Um, this will be different depending on like how, what me your metrics are for your thing, but if you can like scroll, if we just like look in here, we can see that there's JVM thread count, what instance it is, we can see that it's for uh, time leaf, and then like basically more metric data there. Um, so another cool thing is that you don't, like, you don't have to go and use Grafana. Grafana is also super useful, so check that out if you haven't. Um, but built in, there is an option to actually go and just click on a graph. So you can actually go and visualize this because, I mean, at least for me, looking at this table and just seeing a bunch of numbers uh, 
doesn't really tell me much. It's not so useful for me. Maybe it is for other people. But being able to actually see a graph of like what is happening over time, um, that can be super helpful. And then um, with Prometheus, you can also do things like setting up alerts, like say, um, for instance, if this is too high, then you can set up alert for something like that. OK, so I'm going to go back over here. And so that's it for this section. So I'm just going to do a Docker Compose down. So that way I don't cause other problems. OK, so let's go back over to the slides. OK, so for that, we ha basically just like went through, looked at seeing how you get like traces, how you get metrics or like being able to look at them, but we haven't actually had to do anything to make any of this happen. It was all completely set up for us. Um, so there are a few different instrumentation approaches that we're going to be looking into uh, today. So um, just as kind of like a reminder to folks, um, instrumentation basically is the process of adding code or using tools to collect telemetry data. So there, it's kind of split a bit over like part of what I'm doing and part of what he's doing. So um, some things we're going to be looking at is so automatic instrumentation, so basically zero code, or automatic instrumentation but using um, instrumentation libraries, which requires like maybe potentially a little bit of code changes. Um, then there's the section of manual instrumentation, which is fully code-based, and seeing that this is a German keyboard, luckily he's doing that part. Um, so basically, the instrumentation libraries, they make your experience a lot simpler. Um, basically, they're for like, ad basically for adopting open telemetry. So it goes and is just like in injecting instrumentation basically into your popular third uh, party libraries and frameworks. Um, this is super useful for times where we don't want to go like write manual instrumentation, but there isn't something that is native that's already available. So one way of taking advantage of this is just going through it uh, with automatic and not actually having to do any code. And I keep hearing zero code a lot nowadays, especially with like AI and everything like that. So it's just becoming a little bit more popular of a term in general. OK. So section one um, that we have here is yeah, zero code instrumentation. OK. So this is like a simplified down version of what we have. Um, so basically, we have our polyglot application. So basically, we have our Python components. And then we also have our uh, Java components. So both of these components here, we can see that they're over here that we have an agent. And over here, we also have an agent. So there's one for the Java JVM, and then there's also a Python interpreter. So like basically, you have a bytecode instrumentation versus monkey patching. And then the agent can go and basically uh, manipulate code based on the framework, and we're not specifically changing something with how our application is working, or at least the code for it. OK. So um, this is an example from Java. So Sorry to the Python folks if you hate Java. Um, so in Java, basically, the JVM, it provides an interface for where we can load our agent, um, which basically lets us make changes at the bytecode level before it's actually loaded in. Um, so this agent is called using this method called pre-main. You can probably guess that that means that it happens before the main method is actually called. Um, so the nice thing with this is basically you can use execute like arbitrary code um, before the code is actually loaded into the class loader. And it's used for a bunch of things with like telemetry in general. Um, our agent code is then packaged inside of a jar. And then it's pretty simple to actually just go and uh, attach that. Um, for your Java command, you basically add a flag, which is a dash Java agent, and then you pass in the jar for that, and you have your regular application as well. OK. So let's go and actually take a look at this in terms of VS Code. So if I go back over here, I need to go to the correct directory. So if I go into automatic instrumentation, and then initial, and then we're going to go to 
our back end. Okay. So for the folks that um, use Java, um, just out of pure curiosity, who uses Maven? And who uses Gradle? Okay, so more on Maven um, and a little bit on Gradle. Okay, so I'm going to be using Maven. Um, so first I am just going to do Maven clean package. So that basically I'm cleaning my target directory and then I'm building my jar for my application. Um, so right now all I'm doing is just building it so that way I can go and actually be able to um, run my application. That is what we were just looking at earlier. It's just our to-do application. So if I go, I'll just copy it from here so that I don't actually have to type as, uh, dashes because it's in a different spot. Um, so right now I'm just going and running the application. Um, you can see that it's just setting up. I, there's, I'm not gonna really dig into this right now since um, there's nothing, we haven't added anything with OpenTelemetry yet. It's basically just our Java application. So it's just our Spring Boot application that we have as our backend. So in order to actually instrument it with OpenTelemetry, um, we need to actually go and get the, uh, download the agent. It's from GitHub. We can kind of see here that it's github.com slash OpenTelemetry, and you can see that's located there. So if we take a look here, um, we can see that we have the OpenTelemetry Java agent jar here. Okay, so um, basically I'm just going to go run this, um, which, whoops, or pull up the dictionary. That's also an option. Okay, so like I was mentioning earlier, basically the only thing that I'm adding here is I'm adding that flag that lets me pass in my agent. Okay, so right now we're seeing basically a bunch of errors um, because right now what it's trying to do is it's trying to go and, it, based on just like the default setup, it's trying to go and look for a collector. And so right now, we don't have one of those yet, so it's just going to be um, having issues with that. Okay, so in order to actually go and just see how things are working right now with the fact that we do not have that, um, we have some environment variables which we were looking at a little bit earlier. Um, so if, if I copy this and then I'll explain it in a second. All right, so um, we're adding a few things here. Um, if I go and I'll just highlight this here. Um, so we're exporting our traces to our console, so basically so that it shows up in the window that I'm currently in, um, instead of basically looking for um, the collector since, well, we don't have one. Um, for this part here, I'm not doing anything with the metrics or the logs, so I'm just putting that as none. If I go and run my uh, Java command again here, um, we can see that it's actually coming up and running and it's not going and really, it's not complaining about anything, so that is good. You can see that like uh, JPA is being initialized. And also if we look here, you can see the, uh, that we're actually having IO OpenTelemetry and then we have the JDBC library that OpenTelemetry is using. And you can see that it's doing things like going and creating the table inside of our database. So basically initializing it. Okay, so if I just, I'm just gonna open up another tab here. Um, so right now, this is just the back end, so I don't have like a pretty view of it, um, but we have a REST endpoint. So if I just do a curl on localhost 8080, and then it's under to do's, oops, locations. Okay, so we can see here that there is currently nothing in it, which um, makes sense um, since we haven't put anything in there. If I go back over here and scroll the correct direction, um, basically we can see that we're having uh, logging that ends up happening here. Um, so basically you can see things for like, the, there's different tracer libraries that you'll be able to see. Like it's kind of hard here, but this starts with Tom. So this one is for Tomcat. We have um, different ones that are also for say, let's see if we can, it's a little bit hard to see on here. But basically we'll have one, there's another one. Yeah, you can see that we have one for Hibernate. So we have like Spring Data, Tomcat, you can basically go and see um, like the auto instrumentation that is happening there. Um, so if we go back down here and 
I want to actually go and actually add an item. Um, so we can just do another curl. And then, so for this one, I'm doing a post, and I'm going to give it localhost 8080. And let's just say new. Okay, so then if we look back over here, um, like we can see that thing basically just that if we look here, we can see the URL path is here. We can see that we're having a post and that we went and um, added that. Okay, so um, right now with how uh, things are running, again, we're just dumping stuff to the console. I, in addition to the fact that it's set up in a way that you can only see a few things at once, trying to actually go through all of what is happening here, and yes, you can see that it's a tracer, you can see where it's coming from, but like actually understanding where things are coming from and looking into it is not so simple. It's uh, kind of chaotic to read a bit. Um, so basically, what we want is, I'm going to run this Docker run and then explain that. Okay, so um, basically I am starting Jaeger. Um, you can see that the collector, er, there's an environment variable for the collector. Um, so this Jaeger tracing all in one, you can just see it for there. Basically, um, it has, it's Jaeger bundled in with the, uh, with the open telemetry collector bundled in with it. Um, if we just do a Docker PS, um, we can see that we have uh, Jaeger up and running. Okay, so now we actually need to change some of our environment variables because we no longer want it dumping to our console. So we want to switch it over to the open telemetry protocol. And then um, we are configuring the location of the collector to be at localhost. So now if we go and run our uh, Java application again, we can see that that's going up and running. Okay, so if we go back over here and I'm just gonna do another post so that way I'm adding our, my to-do here. If I go over to my ports here and if I go back over to Jaeger, um, we can see that we have the Spring Boot backend here now. Okay, so, and you can also see that it's not the same as earlier. We don't have uh, any of our front ends there for now. Um, if we take a look, we can go and find our traces. If we click on here, um, you can see everything is just one color, unlike earlier. So basically, it's showing you that everything that is happening here is just coming specifically from our back end. So the next thing we want to do is do this similar same type of thing um, with Python, so with our front end that we have. So if I go back over here, if I go into the correct directory again. Okay, so I'm going to go to Flask. Whoops. One day I will actually get used to this keyboard, all right. Okay, all right, so I'm just gonna make sure that the application actually works. So if I do Python and then I have my app, it's called app. Um, so basically we're running, um, we can see that it's actually doing something. So if we go back to here and just jump to our uh, port 5000, we can see that we have our beautiful Python uh, to-do list, and we can see that we have the new that I just added previously on the back end doing a curl. Um, so I can just add, like, I don't know, another thing. So now we have another thing over there. If we go and look back at our traces now, so for instance, let's see, if we look or not that one. Let's find traces. Um, where is my ad? Ah, 
Uh, okay, so, right. I had like three hours of sleep, so don't mind me. So, it's not there because basically we haven't done anything to actually set up open telemetry to be able to find it. So, it's a good thing and it's not there. Um, so, right now we should only find the back end. So for this one, we aren't going and downloading an agent from GitHub, um, but we basically need to install a Python open telemetry package. Um, so if we go back over here, I'm going to go and kill this for now. And then if we go here, I'm going to do a pip install or open the dictionary again. Okay, and then there's actually a thing that you have to go and, um, so basically what we're going through here is we're um, installing the uh, OpenTelemetry distro, so which is the uh, exporter, and then um, we're enabling um, auto instrumentation with our uh, Python apps, which you can kind of see is happening here. It's basically this pip install is giving us this open telemetry bootstrap and then we're having the that. Um, this uninstall is basically at least last when we checked that there was a bug that was happening. Um, so I should run that, uh, why is over here? Um, so just kind of removing that for the moment. Okay, so then there's going to be a bunch of um, exports that we need to add for this one. It's a little bit different, um, but you can, for now, um, we're setting the, Nothing for logs or metrics, but just dealing with the traces. Um, we have our endpoint, and then we have our service name. And right now, we're setting things is insecure in this demo. Since, well, it's a demo. Okay. So um, basically, instead of doing what you normally do with Python and just do Python and then, like, for instance, app.py, um, we have a new, uh, like script that is here. Um, so basically we have, it's, uh, let's see. Okay, open telemetry, there we go. So we have that script, so we have open telemetry instrument, and then at that point we end up doing Python, and then we just give it apt up, pi. Okay, so now we have this running again. If we go back over to Jaeger, And then we go and find our traces again. So if I just go and um, let me try adding something. I don't know how you do high, but why not? All right. So now we can see that there's actually our uh, Flask application that is now showing up here. So if we go and click on it, we can see that we have our Flask and we also have our backend as well. So if we go back over here, I'm gonna pass that off on you. Yeah. So we could now say, okay, that's, that's it, we're done. So we've just instrumented it, but there yeah. are some things missing. Um, I mean, I could tell him to go home. He, I mean, he flew all the way here from Germany. Yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's some things missing. So um, automatic instrumentation which is really nice, and I do know a lot of projects which are mainly basing their instrumentation on that approach. But there is still some use cases where it's very important to maybe also add additional spans, which are maybe also um, yeah, relevant in, in a certain operation, or we also want to maybe um, um, enrich um, a certain span with any operation-specific information, such, such as the search term, or in our case, the name of the to-do. So that's the reason why um, even if we are kind of using an agent approach um, either with Java or Python, um, we can also enrich our data by using the open telemetry library. So the agent is running with the application, but we are still changing some small parts of our code in order to, to enrich the stuff. So we only need to take care about the very fancy custom stuff, but all the um, other frameworks uh, such as um, Tomcat and also the uh, DB connection libraries as well as any HTTP clients, they are instrumented well by um, the open telemetry 
agent and any new instrumentation is going to be written by the community so uh, we can just focus on, on what we want to change for our specific application. So in particular, this, this works as follows. So the agent is collecting the stuff and it's also kind of um, interacting with uh, the library and um, how we can do that, um, I would just show you just in practice. So switching back to our Visual Studio Code, and I'm just, um, yes, going to the um, to do backend Spring Boot um, terminal. Um, I just uh, will just for a second stop it again, and we are now going to have a look at uh, the code quickly. So we're just going to open um, in the source path our files, so there's some Java files, and inside here there's the to-do backend application.java class, and we are quickly going to have a look at this class. So this class is a REST controller, which is just serving some HTTP endpoints, nothing special, um, it's pretty basic. Um, and um, I just want to have a look with you at the post method at to-do, which just previously was used by Tiffany, um, so we just did see this REST endpoint. And now we see all the magic behind this fancy endpoint. So um, it's just um, retrieving a string via a path variable, and this path variable is then just forwarded to this internal method. So if you're now jumping back to Jaeger and we're just having a look at our trace and all the different spans, we do see all the different steps which are, which are automatically um, instrumented, but we do not really see this internal method. But we want to see it because it's a very crucial method, and we want to kind of quickly see if there's any issue with this method. So how we can we add this? So basically, um, when we um, use Java in the context of open telemetry, there is some sort of annotations which you can use. And in order to be able to use these kind of annotations, we first have to add a certain dependency. In this case, it's the open telemetry instrumentation annotations dependency. So I'm just going to copy that into our POM file, which is just in, in that direction. So I'm just opening the POM file quickly. Um, so, so there we, we have all the different dependencies which are already applied to um, our application. And what I will do just now is I'm just going to add this quickly. So unfortunately, I didn't have any XML formatter here installed. So, but yeah, doesn't matter. What you now need to do is we need to quickly just uh, package it again so that we can just use it. So we'll just execute Maven clean package again. We just need to wait a bit until this additional dependency is going to be installed. And once this is installed, we can just use it. So while this is kind of happening, we can just already jump back to our to-do backend application. And there's, there's one, um, the first, um, um, the first which I want to show you is basically the uh, with span, um, the with span annotation. Um, and we can simply add them by just typing with span. This is adding it, and that's all the magic we have to do, not at this method, so that was wrong, but just above the signature of the sum internal method. Now I need to quickly build it again, and now what we can do afterwards, we just can start it again with our open telemetry agent. So just to sum it up, what we did have to do is we just had to add this with span annotation. So searching in the history for the command which Tiffany just did, I'm just hitting enter, and now the application is running again. We still have our Python Flask application running. I'm just double checking if everything is working, so we're going back to our most beautiful of all Python to-do lists, and I'm adding cleaning my desk as my to-do for today. I was just submitting it, and now you see, okay, all the other items just have been removed because I just restarted our application, which, does, yeah, which kind of matches with our... But isn't your desk in Germany? Sorry? I said, isn't your desk in Germany? Yeah, it's in Germany, so it's, it's a, uh, a to-do for next week, maybe. Um, so, Procrastination. 
So basically, uh, now we can have a look into to Jaeger if, if our change just has worked and we try, can try to find our traces. And now we do see, okay, there is um, also this post add. What we now see is, oh, it looks a bit different. We now see the sum internal method as a separate span. So this was a pretty easy one, right? Just adding with span, just compiling it, adding the dependency, and now we have the sum internal method, including all the method, method information here. So it is automatically adding the context in which it is kind of executed. So we do see sum internal method as the signature of the method, and um, it's of type internal. And for sure, we also get this, this process information, which we do usually get with each and every span. So now I just said, okay, we want to also add some operation-specific information. In our case, it would be awesome to just be able to filter our spans by using the to-dos. How can we do that? So we're jumping back to Visual Studio Code. And um, what we additionally can do is we can use the annotation at span attribute. So we have this, this parameter, a string to-do, and I can simply can add the span attribute annotation quickly, which is not resolved. Just give me a second. You just copy the imports. So I'm just check, double checking the imports if everything is working Sorry. as expected and the import is missing, so I'm just adding the import quickly. I'm glad you're doing this section, not me. I don't have to type <laughs> on your keyboard. Yeah. So now it looks better. So what we can now do again is we can simply just stop it quickly. We just build it again. So I'm not just in the wrong tab. So switching back, cleaning it. So we just need to build it again. And what you did see is we just did have to add this span attribute command, and this is already enough to um, just instrument what is kind of being sent inside of this parameter. So let's see if it has worked, and we just click Enter. Running our application again with our open telemetry Java agent. If we're now jumping back to our to-do app, refreshing it, we have no to-dos yet. I still need to clean my desk. So we'll still add this as a to-do. And if you're now switching back to our Jaeger UI and finding one of the most recent traces, so you do see usually the timestamps in here, you can click on that. And if you now click on the sum internal method and we kind of having a look at our text, we do see, ah, it worked. So we just can see cleaning my desk as a to-do. What I will show you quickly, so if I'm not now adding additional to do, something like cleaning my, my room, and we have now to do do's, and you can even use that in your search in Jaeger. So basically, you can just um, also filter your traces by using the text. So you can say, okay, to do is equals to cleaning my desk. And I think I need just to add things. And now you see, okay, I just find that exact trace which consists of that to-do, which is pretty nice, especially in case you want to add some business-relevant information to your spans. It's quite easy to really identify uh, what has happened in your system. So that's all regarding Java, but we still have a Python app, and we want to do the same thing here. Um, so how can I do that here? So for that, I'm switching quickly back to our Visual Studio Code. And in this case, I'm switching to our Python app, quickly stopping it. And we are about to quickly change the code of our app.py file. So we could just go quickly through it. So we do see some, some general imports which are being done. We do see some... Um, standard things to be configured such that the Python app is able to do some requests to our Java application. And there is this most important function, the add uh, function. So there's a root slash add, and this will kind of call this method slash add. 
So in case the request method is posed, this new to do is going to be added. And what we want to do, do right now, we want to really also um, have a separate, um, separate span in here. And we also, also want to add the concrete to do, which was about to send, which is about to send to our Spring Boot application. And uh, for that, we first need to import the tracer. So we can just do that. So just at the top, I am going to add that quickly. So it's currently unused, which does make sense. And we can also create a tracer. And such a tracer also is getting a name. So in this case, it's the todo.tracer. And now what we can do is we can um, go back to our add to do function. And inside of that if statement, we can just say with tracer dot as current span add a span, we will do all the stuff which is below. So I just need to remove that quickly. Remove that one line in there. So now we're fine to go and just making that a bit better visible to you. So now we have to just include it as part of a new span. But what we also want to do, we just want to add this um, new to-do. And for that, i am just prepared that such that I don't misspell it wrong. We can search, just set an attribute. And we do that by doing the following command. So if you have access to your current span, you can just execute set attribute. Then you can define a key and a proper value. In our case, the value is the value of our variable new to-do. So that's basically all we have to do. And um, if we now start our application again, such as with open telemetry, instrument, Python, app.py, we just started, wait a bit, and now we are switching back to our browser, try to access it, we're going to refresh it. Okay, we still have the data there because yeah, the Java application is still running. If I now add an additional to-do, in this case, I'm adding just test, just a simple to-do. And I'm now jumping back to our Jaeger UI, and I'm searching for to do is test. I will find one. And inside of this trace, I first yeah, see as part of the internal method, still we have the to do test available. So this is still working because we didn't change that um, instrumentation. And if we now uh, have a look at our additional method here, we also see that to do dot value is equal to test is was added to this span. So with that, we can just enrich um, the spans which are just collected in our system. Uh, basically, you can just see that we're adding upon things and building up upon it and adding more things to look into so you can actually figure out what is going wrong more easily. Yeah. And it, depending on your use case, this is very useful. Um, and you can, as already said, even use that for business analytics use cases in case you kind of has uh, use that um, that additional tag for any item ID or something like that, and then you can correlate the database on that. So that's that's pretty 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 cool. Um, so in our project, we for instance use that by just also adding the user ID, for instance, or you want to add some custom true client IP which you get from your CDN or something like that. Okay, so with that. We've just learned what we can do with automatic instrumentation. Um, but there's also manual instrumentation. And um, yeah, manual instrumentation means you have to do everything manual. And sometimes there are reasons for doing that. Because you could might say now, OK, it's, there's automatic instrumentation. Why, why, why do you have to deal with manual instrumentation? There are two things. Uh, first, there are some frameworks which are not officially supported. So you might end up using a very specific um, framework which is currently not supported, and then you can still instrument it by using manual instrumentation. And the second reason is, by using manual instrumentation, you really get a crest on how everything is working under the hood. So this is really also kind of, because this is a lab, it's also about to kind of uh, show you how everything is working. So it's, it's a very good start to learn how these concepts are currently implemented. 
So this is like the ideal world. So we, we unfortunately do not live in the ideal world. So in case you have a web app with a web server, a cache client lib, an HTTP client, or a DB driver, or any messaging service lib, it would be ideal if any of these frameworks are just supporting um, open telemetry, and they're just directly exposing it. You just have to configure environment variables, and everything's working. But we're not there yet. We're not yet there, but a lot of things are kind of changing and evolving. But in order to kind of fix that gap, we have the open telemetry SDK, which you can use in order to create our own spans and kind of really uh, um, uh, build things uh, which really uh, suits our needs. And in the end, the SDK is then just putting the stuff to our observability platform, which could be Jaeger, which could be Prometheus, or any other platform which is kind of, yes, providing you with pers persistence features as well as dashboarding features. So uh, we are now, again, going to focus on tracing now. Um, so the lab is also covering other stuff, but we are, for now, only, only um, focusing on tracing. So I just brought you a very simple procedure or a program, so which consists of two methods, which are kind of synchronously called. So we have to, you have the, the timeline in here. And in case you want to kind of really manually measure the duration of these methods, including all the context which is relevant for you, you usually do it by having a start span procedure, where you kind of define a certain name, in this case, method one, and uh, you uh, define um, um, a certain stop. So this is kind of defining your span. So your span has a start and your span has an end. And you can do that with, with any method. So in this case, we have done that with, with two methods. And what you get is basically just, yes, an entity, an object, which consists of your span ID, your trace ID. So this is saying, OK, to which trace do I belong? And also your parent span context, so who is my parent? and also a name, yeah, um, which usually should identify what's happening at some point. Yeah. Also a kind, is it a server, an internal or client span? And you can add additional attributes, such as the thread ID, your process ID, and so on and so forth. So this is like what, what, what's been collected by using that kind of operation which is usually happening. And this kind of is, is I think this is, this is true for any manual tracing framework which, which is or was out there. So how, how to put that in, into a context? How is, is that working in, um, in open telemetry? And especially, how is this context enrichment working? So when configuring open telemetry or your open telemetry SDK uh, in your runtime in Python or Java, you first need to define your open telemetry configuration. And as part of this configuration, you can define a resource, and a resource can consist of many different um, um, entities. Um, and this, in the end, is kind of a key value map which identifies where your application is running. For instance, your application name, your machine name, your cloud provider name, your availability zone. You can add anything you want, maybe your deployed version. So that's basically everything which is related to your runtime environment. In the middle, still, we have our um, we still have our um, spans, which consist of what we've already seen, the name, span context, attributes, and so on and so forth. On the other side, we have additional span attributes which are operation specific. So you do not want to always add the to-do field because the to-do field is not available everywhere. So this is very operation specific. And the span is trying to kind of um, aggregate all this data so, such that in each span you can see, okay, this was happening in that certain pod, for instance, in that certain instance, in that certain availability region, and in this operation, this variable had this certain value. So this is kind of all uh, which is together. And how does that look like in practice? I just brought to you a Java example. So we do have our add to do method, which we just have seen before, and we can do everything also manually. And we can do that by using our um, tracer. I can show you how you kind of add this tracer afterwards. And we can just create that span. So in the end, you, you see we do execute the um, command start span. And we also define a certain span kind. And what we additionally can do, we can just set some arbitrary attributes. In this case, these attributes are kind of um, um, yeah, in, in the HTTP context, so we do set uh, the um, method, the URL, and, and so on and so forth. But you can set anything you want, for sure. You, there, there's a, um, 
there are multiple possibilities. And the most important thing is you somehow have to say, okay, now the span has been ended. Um, so this is like how you can do that. So just to, to highlight it, these are kind of the, the, the snippets which you need as an additional code to instrument your method. So when you're using the open term SDK, this usually follows some kind of a pipeline. So you have a tracer, and this tracer gives you the possibility to start and stop spans, as you already did see. Then we get some, some span object. The span object kind of uses some operation-specific data and is, is kind of created in the context of your application. And then you have a span process, which can add some additional resource-related um, information, and you can also define certain different span exporters. We, we just did see the exporters just before what Tiffany showed you. So you can just have a logging span exporter, which just logs you each and every trace, which is very nice for debugging, but it doesn't work really well when you really want to kind of work with the data. And there's also an OTLP uh, trace exporter, which you can still use. And this exporter is then configured as such that it kind of sends the data usually to any tracing backend. So that's the overall pipeline which is being used. So now, let's do that. And we jump back to Visual Studio Code. In this case, I would just quickly stop all the applications quickly and um, so that I don't mess up with that here. And I will just go to another folder. Basically, the folder structure, which you do see here, I hope you can see it, is kind of the same for the, for the training. So it's basically the, the, the part which is available in our GitHub repository. You can just use it. And um, I'm going to the folder manual instrumentation Java. And here I go into the initial folder. And we have the to-do backend Spring Boot application, which we want to which you want to modify. And the first step is, as already said, we somehow need to configure all the stuff. So where should the data be sent? Um, which uh, span exporter uh, do we want to use? And for that, I've just prepared um, a class, which is under my helpers. Need to find it quickly. There it is. So this is the class, Java class, which I'm going to copy into the manual instrumentation part. So I'm just going to copy it here. Um, and we can just quickly see, before we really deep dive into it, OK, I'm just missing some dependencies. So for sure, I need to first add some dependencies. And I will quickly just do that, just for, for the sake of simplicity. I'll just remove all that stuff quickly. So. And um, I will, I'm going to additionally open the POM file. And um, I've just prepared the additional dependencies which, which I do need for that stuff. So I'm just copying it. I will ju just show it to you later. So we'll just make that a bit bigger. that, just copying it in here, and request just quickly install my XML <laughs> formatter in parallel so that I can beautify it afterwards. Um, in addition to that, we need to kind of include the dependency management uh, reference to our version so that such that the correct version is also being used. So we can just add that just below here. So after having these two parts, um, we are fine to go. I'm just trying to format it quickly. Now it's prettier. So I can quickly show you what I've just added. So I just did add the OpenTelemetry API, the SDK, the exporter logging, exporter OTLP, and also um, some semantic conventions. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm fine to go. And uh, what I will do now is I'm jumping back 
to the Alton Telemetry the configuration class, which I've just added, and we can just quickly show. So this is basically just the configuration bean which um, was created, and inside of this, um, this class, we first created a resource, and this resource, um, yes, just has some additional resource attributes, such as the service name, in this case it's the do, do backend, um, we can also change that to KubeCon. And uh, we can also put in some additional um, stuff in here. And um, in addition to that, as already shared in the previous slides, so we need an SDK tracer provider, which provides us our um, tracer. And we can then add a span processor and um, a logging span exporter. So with that, our traces are now just locked on the console. So that's where we just start. And um, afterwards, we just need to have the open telemetry um, object, which just has the tracer provider in it. And um, this is what we just return and want to use um, in our to-do backend application Java class. So I would just run quickly Maven Spring Boot run so that we see if everything works. And I didn't mess up with anything, but it looks good so far. So we've just added our dependencies. We just defined our open telemetry configuration, and we now can just start to add our first instrumentation. And we do that by uh, using our beloved um, add to do method. And uh, we just start by creating a span. And um, we can just do that uh, when we have our um, tracer available. And for that, we first need to create um, our um, tracer. So I will just create our tracer in here, which should be a private variable, which is part of our class. We'll just do that, adding that. So we need to initialize that. In order to initialize it properly, I'm going to just um, also add an additional public constructor inside of this public constructor. I'm just um, using the open telemetry object so I can just review the open telemetry configuration. And that's how our tracer is now getting initialized. You do see in, our lo in my logs, okay, I, I, it seems like it works. So we now have our tracer available in the class where we want to instrument stuff. So now let's start with the add to do method as already said before. So I'm going just back to this method. And uh, what I first have to do, I just have to start my span. I can just do that by typing in tracer dot um, span builder, and then I can just um, provide a name of the trace. In this case, it's add to do, and then I can just say start span. That's it, almost, because I somehow need also to end the span. In order to do that, I need to store that span in a local variable. So now we have a local variable called, um, called span. And we can afterwards, just, just before the return statement, makes sense because we kind of want to track the, the time which is being spent also within the sum internal method, we can just then say, okay, we now want to end that span. And that's basically all for now. So we, with that, we've just, um, we've just did a manual instrumentation. And um, now we need to create, as before, we, we need to create some, some traffic. You know, we want to see if it works as expected. So we do that by just creating additional curl. And I will just add a new to do, set HTTP method to post, send it. And what we do see is, ah, okay, since we have activated the um, logging exporter, we do see, okay, um, there is um, a new um, span created with this ID, and um, that's the information we got. 
Unfortunately, this information is not yeah, too kind of in, yeah, informative, so that's the reason why I'm just adding additional log statement and just um, um, putting, uh, using the two string method and printing everything into the console such that we see, okay, what's, what, what's kind of stored inside that span. Just doing that again, so this has been updated. Just execute the same command again. And now we do see a, lo a lot of more information. So um, I would just uh, increase the font size a bit. So what we, what we do get is, no, I missed it. Uh, just give me a second. Now we have it. So we, we do get um, a span ID, which is just um, created automatically. We do add, also get the uh, parent span context. In this case, everything is set to zero, which means, OK, there is no parent. So uh, this is the root span, which we have. And um, there are also some additional metadata, such as the kind and so on and so forth, which is we set as best, and for sure also in addition, the timestamps, uh, which are as well relevant. So with that, um, we just have shown, okay, this seems to work uh, pretty nice. Um, we can also set some additional attributes. So let's just do that. So we can just say, okay, um, I want to set um, attribute um, in this case, I want to set the HTTP.method is equals to post. Just waiting until it's kind of rebuilt. Do that again. And I maybe messed up with something. It needs, needs to reload quickly. Ah, okay, it works. Yeah. Lucky me. So um, what we now see is that we do have an attributes map, map, and in this attributes map, we do have what, what we've just added. The attribute HTTP.method is equal to post. So that's, that's all we can do. And um, one more thing which you can for sure do, you can do this also with dynamic data. I will just skip that part because it's just, just referencing any, any dynamic variable in here. So that's how you can also just add any dynamic data. So maybe one, one last thing I, I would show basically is how we can also use that um, in a nested manner. And for that, I want to just also try to instrument these internal method as well in a manual manner. Um, so I'm just going to copy that stuff because this is almost the same. Um, I just call that internal method. Call that child span so that we know, OK, this is kind of a different type stuff. And we again, just before the return statement, we can then say, just say, OK, span end, and with that, with, okay, client spin for sure. Um, we've, we've just added, ah, thanks. Thanks to the audience. <laughs> they think with me, so. Um, I just missed to use the proper reference. And uh, now we just cr did create that. And if we now just also add the, the, the proper logging statement as well in our method, uh, we're just going to add that as well just after we've ended a span for sure. And referencing not the client span, but the child span. Or the child span span. Or child span span, yeah. Um, so we just do the same procedure again. We just execute it. And if you now have a look at our data, we do see two log statements. So this is basically our internal method, which was just um, recorded. You do that, see that as well here in the name. And we do see this is kind of the parent span. But there's one thing which kind of doesn't really match up because um, the parent span context of this client span is zero as well as this one. So it seems like they're not really connected. 
This means in this case, when you're using manual instrumentation, you also need to take care about proper um, context propagation. And how you can do that, I can quickly show that to you. And we do that by jumping back to our add to do method, um, which is calling our internal method. And um, for really connecting these spans, um, you can use uh, that a try catch block. And we just surround our method here. So we just add this here um, and surround it. And um, in our finally block, we can ju then just we can then just uh, end our span. Just double checking if, if the scope is has been properly added to the dependencies. Just refreshing it quickly again. So if you now have a look at OK, I need to kind of fix quickly the dependency here because it was not um, automatically added. But luckily, we have a solution file, so I can just quickly have a look at it um, and have a look at the proper scope dependency, which I need to add here as well. And now the application sh should build again, and hopefully now it works. Who? Lucky me again. And if we now have a look at our data, so we we'll just add, entering some, some, some spaces in here, um, we do see that we now have again our child span, um, but now in this case, the context is properly uh, propagated. So. We do have the span ID um, of that span already available. So this is kind of matching up, um, which means we now have connected the, these two spans by just providing the current span context. But you need to take care about that. So now we've basically connected them. So um, having a look at the time, I would say we, we, we stop here in, um, at the um, practical part. So you can just continue on doing that. So this is for sure um, available um, at GitHub. And we can just jumping back to our slides. So just as a reminder, you can just go on that site and just um, register for, for the training. Um, yeah, it's for free. So you can just go inside there. And um, yeah, it's more or less following the same structure. There's much more to learn than what we could share within 90 minutes, for sure. So um, just have a look at it. So there's also some additional theoretical material which you can kind of can check out in going through it. And also, the practical parts are um, similar as we did it, kind of well documented. And you can just follow that guide and just do that on your own, just maybe next week. So um, then you can just take your time and go through that. Part. And there's, if you haven't done any of these uh, courses on the Linux Foundation before, basically there's a bunch of information. You follow along like with some things that we're doing, and then there's like little quizzes at the end to like check your knowledge. And I, if you came in late earlier, uh, there was a notification that just came out today that was mentioning that there is now an open telemetry certification. So you can go through this to try learning more stuff to hopefully pass that. Um, I guess maybe that'll be on my future to-do list after I learn all of the stuff that he did. <laughs> but yeah, so you can just go and dig into that. Yes, and maybe one more comment regarding code spaces. So as we just um, said, um, when we started with our talk, you can just go also and um, you don't are not forced to kind of start it in your own wishes to do code, but instead you can just go on, on GitHub and you can click on code and then add a new code spaces. Um, 
instance, and this will just setting everything up in your browser. You will have Visual Studio Code available in your browser, and you can basically do the same procedures we, as we just did, but just in the browser. So this is kind of pretty lightweight, and you can just start right away. Maybe some of you already did try it out. If not, um, feel free to try it out maybe this afternoon. Yeah. So this will take a while until it's ready, but yeah, then afterwards you can just use it. And yeah, if you have anything that you want to ask afterwards, um, you can find us on LinkedIn and a bunch of other places. Um, this is probably, for me at least, this I think is the 17th or something conference that I've spoken at this year, and I'm taking a, a break from this afterwards for a little bit, not just doing all this, but looking for what is next. So if you are um, looking to hire someone for developer advocacy or know someone who does, please tell me about that. And yeah, so thanks again for coming. Um, please give feedback, um, especially so that way we can make improve, have improvements be made in the training that is out there and everything like that. Um, so that would be super appreciated and awesome. But yeah, thank you so much for coming. And I guess the folks that are still here, are you cool with me taking a photo of us to prove that this actually happened? <laughs> All right, sweet. <laughs> Sweet, thank you so much.